As you can see, our tomato patch is really filled in. Hi, I'm Sue Gray, former host of Oklahoma Gardening. Good to see everyone again. And today we're in my garden, and this is shot in early summer, late spring, early summer. And just want to show you around at some of the things that are growing. It's been a difficult spring in Oklahoma. Every spring is different and difficult. This one uh, had an extended cool period, which made for a glorious salad garden. This was planted in late March, and uh, we have turnips, bok choy, and I let the bok choy bolt because it attracts beneficial insects. I like to see those little pollinators around. Uh, we have a braising mix. We're at the tail end of our butter crunch lettuce. We have lacinato kale, and that is still good. I like to harvest these smaller inner leaves because they're a little more tender. And then um, kohlrabi, we have both purple and the white right here. Very colorful. And just think of that as an above ground turnip. And it takes the heat a little better than turnips. So as our Tokyo cross turnips are finishing up, we can switch to eating the kohlrabi. And um, my family and I like to have something fresh on the table every day. So this garden is not huge, but it has a lot of interplanting and our, um, our objective is to have something fresh to eat seasonally. Uh, we have the rainbow chard and I love growing chard. We grow it all winter long in containers in a small cold frame and then of course we have it here in the garden. And I prefer chard to lettuce now because it doesn't go bitter, it takes the heat, takes the cold, and it's just a wonderful salad green. And as you know, it's a variant of beets. Uh, it's a type of beet that was bred for foliage instead of the roots. We have carrots here, three different varieties. And uh, I can always tell if my garden needs irrigating if my carrots are hard to pull out. So I keep these raised beds pretty moist. This is a Nantes type carrot, so it's fairly cylindrical in shape. And then over here, uh, we have three varieties of beets that are, are not quite mature yet, but uh, there are golden beets and red both. And I had a neighbor here yesterday asking why everything's so crowded together. And that's to help with weed control. And if you're going to grow things in a small space like these raised beds, you want to maximize the crops you have. I have a small crop of potatoes here. And then we have tomatoes uh, using the stake and weave method. These are uh, some cherry tomatoes called black cherry, certainly not ripe yet. And then I've interplanted some small Red Bull uh, bell peppers here and interplanted melons here. This is Lily Crenshaw melon. And as it grows, it can spill out into my aisleways and still leave the tomatoes plenty of space to grow. Um, right here we have some cauliflower that is just forming a head. And I could have covered them with Remay to keep the pests out instead of been hand picking because again, it's just a very small garden. I'm out here every day. So I use clothespins to blanch the heads keep the sun out. You could also use string or rubber bands. I tend to use a lot of clothespins in the garden because I use Remay for frost protection. I use wire coverings on things for wildlife prevention. Um, they're just useful for all kinds of things, including hanging up laundry. In some other areas of the garden, I have more interplanting. Um, if you look right here, the, behind this fence is our spring strawberry crop. It's just finishing up. And I have this plastic construction fence here because squirrels, birds, and all kinds of critters love strawberries. And so when it was cold, I was able to cover it with Remay. Uh, now that it's warm, I can cover the top with more wire to keep the birds out or Remay using clothespins again. And then I use old pieces of leaky hose about this size and shape to just sort of lay around the garden because they kind of look like snakes, and I, I like to think that that scares the birds away as well. No scientific proof on that, but I've used that in the past to, among my tomatoes. I'll lay those pieces around. It looks like a black snake, so who knows. Uh, right here, just coming on, we have some bush beans, and they're just now flowering. It's a variety called tender green. 
And then I have two varieties of peas. Uh, these are um, super sugar snap. And of course they're edible, completely edible pod. You can eat the whole thing. And you need to know your pea varieties so you know when to harvest them. And these of course can be picked at any time. You wanna get them before they're too big. And if they get large, you do have to pull the strings off, but the whole pod is edible. This variety is uh, more of a traditional pea variety that when I purchased it, the package said snow peas. And that's where it does not pay to buy cheap seed because they're not snow peas. You have to shell these out and they are delicious, um, but the pod is not edible and they are uh, fairly tough, but you can pick them when they're real young, I guess, and stir fry them. But basically uh, we're shelling these out and using them to make potato salad and just eating them fresh. And certainly you can eat them raw in the garden as well. On around here, um, one way I'm able to get a lot of production or productivity out of the raised beds is I don't own a rototiller and even though um, we are a small family, I do all the gardening pretty much myself and so I like to use forks of different sizes. More than just for eating, <laughs> I like a small fork like this if I'm digging out weeds or dividing perennials. And this is a child's spading fork but it's great for small raised beds. And then I'll use a fork like this for digging potatoes um, or just cultivating in general around the garden. And then this is my primary tillage tool. Those of you who are involved in production agriculture know what that means. Primary tillage is initially breaking the ground. And a lot of you have heard of broad forks and you've seen broad forks for sale in catalogs. I just discovered this one this spring and it is really built to last. It weighs 22 pounds and is built out of the same kind of steel that you might use on a tractor and so on. And I don't think it's ever going to break. And some catalogs when they sell their broad forks say, um, we do sell replacement tines. Well, that was a red flag to me. And so bought this one. It was expensive, but I think I'm pretty sure it will outlive me. But this is an area of Bermuda grass that I loosened up earlier, about a, two months ago, and uh, didn't get back to it. You know how you get busy in the garden, but I do intend to loosen this up and plant a strip of purple hole peas next week. And so you put this in the ground and you lean it forward and just ride it. It's easy. Easy on your back. You and just lift up and you don't lift it, you just slide it back, rotate forward, and you just ride it back again. And um, comes from a company called Meadow Creature. I've not seen any other company sell one particularly like this. So I'm not on retainer with them or anything. And it wasn't free, I just like it. So you can use that to loosen the ground up. And then you can go back and of course pick the Bermuda grass out. If you don't have Bermuda grass, you're really in, in good shape because you can just prepare your ground. And so my regular beds, I'm able to go for, down 14 inches. You can see I'm not huffing and puffing. It's just easy. And it cultivates the soil without disturbing the microorganisms in the soil so much. It's not turning the ground over, it's just loosening it. And I think that's the key to having peas that are six feet tall. So here's where I'm spending time these days, enjoying retirement. I hope you're enjoying your garden as well. <laughs>